Please welcome our panel to the stage. Thanks so much uh, to Shana for that wonderful introduction, to, to everyone on the EconCon team, to all of our staff uh, here at the hotel and who helped put this on, and to all of you uh, for being here. We're really excited to have this great panel to talk about three really amazing pieces of legislation that, as you've heard this morning, uh, are quite extraordinary. The Infrastructure Law, the CHIPS Act, uh, and the Inflation Reduction Act. And you know, where I'd like to start is maybe with, with Joel. And you know, we've, we've heard a little bit about um, the importance of these bills, and I think most of the people here were following the news as they were being passed. But from, from your perspective, what is so significant about this legislation and, and how do you see its importance in shaping our economy? Thanks, Ganesh. And thank you, Lindsay. Thank you to the whole Groundwork team for having me here. It's a pleasure to just see how this conference has grown and become a really important network for so many <coughs> thinkers in the economic space. I'm so glad to be here today and also glad to talk about these bills and kind of you know, what it really means for how we're thinking about the economy today. And I say that because we really need to think about this agenda, I think many people here will agree, as a part of an economic strategy, an industrial strategy. And you've heard many folks in the administration say that for a reason. And that's in part because in the coming decades, we really do need a massive economic transformation, both on the domestic and global economic fronts, to be able to meet the needs of the moment. For instance, tackling the climate crisis, right? It means we need to build and make things at scale. Clean energy, clean energy infrastructure, right? clean energy technologies, overall infrastructure. We need to build economic resiliency um, and, and actually build reliable supply chains. Right? That means we have national and economic security uh, imperatives as well, but also we need to do this in a way that reverses decades of underinvestment in our communities, including the racial inequities that we still see persisting today. And to do that, you really do need a new economic strategy. Um, and I think that there's a real logic to that, and that's why these bills are so important. There's a logic to that. There are econ there's an economic logic to what's going on right now. Um, we are solving for problems that the private sector cannot solve on its own. That means, you know, we're investing in technologies that have a high upfront cost. There's a long horizon to being able to see a return to that investment. Those are just places where the private sector is not going to come in on its own. You need, you know, public power. You need government action. Um, there, are, there are places where we're not pricing in the risks, right? This is very well known in the climate space, but also the risk of not having economic resilience. We saw that full, in full force during the pandemic where we saw really acute disruptions in the supply chains, right? But we still have those long-term fragilities that we need to solve for. And also at the same time, we have to solve for this kind of valley of death phenomenon where a lot of the technologies that we need to be able to solve our big economic problems, including the climate crisis, just won't get to market because the funding is not there when it's time for, actually, for us to actually build and commercialize a prototype. So I say all these things because that is why these bills invest in both the supply side, actually being able to produce things, but also on the demand side, making sure that there's a buyer at the other end. And if you do that, you can actually grow markets, you can shape markets, and you can actually in some ways create whole new markets. And we wanna do that in a way that is, that is high road, right? There's a way to do that is, that is just low road, compete on lowest cost, low worker standards, right? In some ways, low quality products, but we wanna do that in a way that is high road, that creates good quality union jobs in the United States. Sure. I think that's a, that's a very extremely helpful overview of what, what we're trying to do and what, what the administration's been doing. Uh, Samira, you were in the National Economic Council when these bills were going through. So I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about what is in the IRA, what is in the, the infrastructure bill, how, how does the CHIPS Act work? What are these um, uh, specific kind of areas that are gonna achieve the goals that, that Joelle was outlining? Um, sure. Uh, I'm happy to do that. Again, thank you to the team at Groundwork for this amazing conference and for all the sponsors for having um, bringing us together. Um, what these bills really represent, and I really want to build off of what Joelle said um, to expand on this economic framework, is it's showing an approach to um, shape markets, shape markets in a way that drives middle out growth. And that really stands in contrast to that neoliberal approach that Shana was speaking about. That was about trickle down, that left too many people in places behind, and instead, 
um, these bills um, try to achieve three things. Stronger growth, as Joelle laid out, fundamentally stronger growth as a country, an increase in quality jobs, and lower costs for families. And um, they and there are three kind of tools in the toolbox in these bills that I want to point out to folks in this room that help drive these more middle out, high road market dynamics into the industries that the government is investing in. So one, um, investing in so the supply and the demand side of an industry. Two, requiring or incentivizing worker and community benefits. And the third is kind of thinking about place, investing in and driving investments into under-resourced places and communities. So if I could take a minute and just like describe each of those um, further, unpack them a bit. On the supply and demand market shaping side, I feel like the transportation sector offers like one of the best examples there. We have to reduce emissions by, to, to reduce emissions, to, to, redu to achieve our climate goals. We need to move away from gas powered vehicles to, to electric vehicles. Well, we can juice demand, as Joelle said, by lowering costs for families. And that's what the bills do. They offer tax credits and lower costs for new electric vehicles, for used electric vehicles, and for leased electric vehicles. So families of different income levels can um, afford those and they don't become a boutique good. Um, they also um, help overcome things like the range anxiety people feel if they can't find an EV charger by investing in public infrastructure in a nationwide network of EV chargers. But that's just one piece of what's holding back um, the, the transformation of the auto industry. There, there is, are a set of supply side problems um, in making sure that um, auto factories today are able to produce electric vehicles, that we have the inputs that we need for um, those electric vehicles. So there are a whole side of tax credits and grants um, to build EVs and build the batteries in America, even using existing factories, retooling existing factories um, to get that done. And so by combining supply and demand side tools, you can more quickly pull a whole industry towards um, combating climate change, supporting workers and supporting communities. Um, on the workers and community benefits agreement, side um, across these each of the bills, um, there are incentives and requirements um, that condition or incentivize companies to invest in workers. Um, so the CHIPS Act, I think some of you may know this is the bill that invests in um, the domestic semiconductor industry and semiconductor supply chains. Well, it was $15 billion appropriated by Congress, and the Commerce Department put out the rules for receiving that money back in, I want to say, February. Um, and uh, those rules include a mandate that companies that receive these funds have to provide high quality, affordable childcare to their workers, not just their, thank you, but not, and not, and this is important, not just for their production workers who they ultimately hire, but for the construction workers who are gonna build these multi-billion dollar fabs. And, and that's just one example of um, a worker and community benefit. It also has an emphasis on supplier diversity so that you pull forward a more diverse supply chain and diverse ownership of firms who are feeding into this new industry. Um, in the power industry, the green tax credits Shalanda talked about that Congress is, that the Republicans really want to take away, they have prevailing wage requirements and or incentives, prevailing wage and registered apprenticeship incentives so that companies can receive a huge increase in the tax credits, taxes, tax breaks that they receive if they're paying a prevailing wage and training workers, especially in union apprenticeships. Um, and then lastly, on the kind of place-based um, approach to Bidenomics, um, these bills focus investments or try to focus investments in underserved communities and regions. And some of the levers you'll see in the bills for that are um, on the, um, again, on the, on the clean energy production side, producers of clean energy get extra incentives if they build in a low income community or in a prior energy community. So communities that really um, are dependent on a fossil fuel um, extraction economy. 
But the money doesn't all go to um, private companies. There is um, a lot of support in this bill to strengthen community-based organizations' ability to organize and access federal funding. A specific example there is the EPA um, and the Department of Energy just put out $177 million to build 17 regional technical assistance centers. And the, they call them Tic Tacs. I can't tell if that's a good name or not, but Tic Tacs is what we're going to go by. Um, and they're designed to help communities that have been overburdened by legacy pollution and left out economically get the assistance they need to write grants or manage federal grant compliance. This stuff's very, very technical. And we listened and we heard about how community groups need to have the power to shape all that. And so there was a large amount of money in the bill to now support that community-based groups getting that technical assistance. Um, and then uh, um, also to drive place-based coalitions that are multi-sector to bring together business elites and community groups and local government, you have funding like the $500 million Tech Hubs program that the Commerce Department is implementing now that's going to invest in um, economic development programs around equitable technology-led economic growth. So um, these are some examples of what is now possible thanks to these bills and how it really drives a whole new um, economics. Uh, I just want to close by flagging one other really important tool that is now available in, in these legislations, and that is really new um, public ownership and business models are enabled by the legislation. And yesterday's conversation, I think we heard a lot about this, but you have programs like the Greenhouse Gas Reduction Fund, um, which also the Republicans keep threatening to take away. That's $27 billion to capitalize community-led financial institutions and state green banks, like public green banks, to create financial products at lower costs and pollution in low-income households, rather than, unfortunately, what I think a lot of us have grown up experiencing, financial markets that extract wealth from these households. Um, and so really excited to see the new business models and public ownership um, that uh, is going to be possible because of all of this legislation and show the American people in a really concrete way that public power can shape markets so we can take the scale and ingenuity of markets and get them to work for people, communities, and the planet, not just have markets that work for shareholders and corporate executives. I think that was extremely helpful. I know for if, if, if any of you are like me, it's there's a lot in these bills. And so getting a real breakdown of what the different components are and how they're important, I think is just, it's so valuable. Uh, for all of us. I want to follow up, um, and maybe Benga, you, you can speak to some of this. You know, Samira talked about the place-based features and importance um, of the work that's going to happen in these bills. And one of the things I think we've seen over the last half century or so is a real shift in geographic inequality that's deepened other kinds of inequality, kind of success of superstar cities and, and big cities, but not as much in, in smaller places and in rural places. Um, you know, you do work on rural development, so could you speak a little bit to how rural America is going to intersect with this legislation, how this work will actually impact and influence the issues of inequality and economic development in, in rural parts of our country? Thank you, and I want to thank the uh, groundwork and the team here, and especially uh, Claire for the invitation. Um, one of the things I'm excited about is to be able to talk about what's happening in rural places. And so, you know, Joel talked about this new industrial strategy. This is not going to work if rural America is not at the table. And more importantly, if we don't tell the story to these rural communities, none of this is going to work. And, you know, a lot of cases, this is why certain things are able, like, are on the table to get cut, because no one understands what's happening. But the beauty of all the things that have passed, ARP, bipartisan infrastructure law, chips and science, and IRA, is that rural America is at the table in these bills. And so I could talk a lot about the other ones, but I want to focus on IRA. And so in for specifically for rural places, there's $13 billion that are going to rural places from the Inflation Reduction Act through clean energy. And so I'm going to say it again. 
13 billion dollars a b so i've been at rural development for two and a half years and everything we talk about is always with millions we get millions here millions there but now we're talking about billions of dollars and so this is the biggest investment in rural places since the new deal but the difference is this is the first time we're actually being inclusive about rural communities that we're actually you know they're at the table you know rural communities rural communities of color that we're actually you know being intentional intentional about where we're putting the money and making sure they're at the table. So I wanna speak specifically about what this $13 billion are. So first, there's our Rural, America, Rural Energy for America program. This is a clean energy that goes to uh, agriculture producers and rural small businesses. And so there's $2 billion that's gonna be allocated for them to do any sort of clean energy projects, you know, carbon capture, um, solar panels, wind, all kinds of things. And so, you know, $2 billion is gonna be uh, allocated to them. Then we have two new programs. One is called the Power, Powering Affordable Clean Energy Act. And so that's a uh, PACE. And that's a billion dollars that goes to a lot of different uh, municipalities to do, again, a lot of clean energy. And then speaking to Samir's point about public bodies, we have $9.7 billion. This is New Era, which is the Empowering Rural America that goes to rural energy, uh, rural electric cooperatives to be able to put um, any sort of clean energy projects. And so if you think about the history of how we've, um, you know, going back to that new deal, you know, we electrified all these farms throughout U US and that was through rural electric cooperatives. In fact, that kind of really got them going and made them sustainable. So now nearly a hundred years later, we're doing the same thing, but with clean energy. And so again, this is the kind of thing where it's like, you have rural America at the table in all these plans. And it's very important because, you know, also you were talking about EVs and doing a nationwide network. You can't have a nationwide EV network without having EVs in rural places, right? And so there's a lot of you know um, work that we're doing with the Department of Transportation, Department of Energy, to be able to put these electrical vehicle um, chargers and charging stations throughout the country. But one of the cool things, and one of the things that we have to be thinking about is, it's not just putting in the EV charging stations in these places. You have to have people who understand maintenance to be able to construct, to be able to do that. And so now you're bringing jobs to these communities, well-paying union jobs to these communities. And so that's the way we have to think about this. And so, and this is stuff that we're already doing, but then are we telling the story? And so that's going to be the important thing from here on out that to be intentional about implementation, implementation and then be intentional about telling the story and making sure the story is heard. Yes. Well, one of the other big stories, and, and all of you touched on it um, so far in your comments, and you know we've all lived it in the last couple of days here, thinking about just being outdoors, um, is just what's happening with with climate and the the cascading number of crises that we face um, in in the environment, in ecosystems, um, and with our air, with our water, with everything. So um, you know, Noah, your work as an economist is largely on climate and energy issues, and this is a big component of what these bills are doing is working on these questions. So could you tell us a little bit about how you see the impact of these bills in addressing the climate challenge? Sure, happy to. Um, thank you for the question and for inviting me to this all-star panel. Um, and I have to say the chairs are incredibly comfortable up here. <laughs> so uh, thank you for that too. Um, so, you know, I think a lot of people just hear the bottom line numbers when it comes to climate spending, right? There's the CBO, whatever, $380 billion. Goldman Sachs says maybe it's over a trillion dollars in spending. Um, so th there's sometimes I think there's this perception that we're just throwing bags of money at the problem. Um, and I think that really masks what's a very carefully designed, thoughtful strategy when it comes to climate and the energy transition, um, particularly if you think not just of IRA, but as part of the broader um, administration strategy. Uh, really, you can go sort of sector by sector where the uh, major sources of emissions are, power, transportation, industry, um, and you really have measures that uh, are targeted at innovation, right, developing sort of new emerging technologies. Uh, you have infrastructure spending to help sort of facilitate uh, deployment of these technologies. And you have, particularly with IRA, you have a focus on deployment, right? And, and 
tax credits and other measures that will uh, incentivize take up of these technologies. So um, that being said, right, this is a pretty, this is, this is unprecedented, right? We've, we've, we've never done these things before. So uh, to a first approximation, I think we really have no idea what this bill will accomplish. Um, <laughs> I, I actually feel more comfortable talking about the counterfactual worlds, um, which is a little bit weird, but also good because you can't fact check me on counterfactuals. They'll, ne they'll never happen. Um, but uh, let me talk about, let me tell you about two counterfactual worlds of, of, of not passing um, these pieces of legislation. So first, from a climate perspective, uh, you know, absent some sort of miracle, uh, I don't think we were going to get another shot at major climate legislation, um, you know, for the foreseeable future. So, I mean, what that means is we would have missed our 2025 emissions target. Uh, you know, the Biden administration's big 2030 target, 50% emissions reductions, uh, it would have been abundantly clear that we were going to miss that by a mile. Uh, you know, functionally, what that means is that, uh, you know, the United States is, is, is not participating in the Paris Climate Agreement in any meaningful way, and the Paris Agreement's not going to work without the United States. So, I, you know, I, I really don't think it's too much of an exaggeration to say um, that this is the difference, uh, you know, between sort of not having another sort of decade in the wilderness when it comes to climate action. Let me give you one more counterfactual, which is imagine a world that is uh, rapidly decarbonizing, uh, but does not have the, you know, industrial policy and place-based type policies that, um, you know, my fellow panelists have been describing here. So, you know, I think it's important to remember that the United States is the world's biggest producer of oil. We're the world's biggest producer of natural gas, right? These millions of Americans are employed in these industries. They, they, they're important, not just for our energy system, but for our economy. Um, as I'm sure you know, they're very geographically concentrated too, right? So we have thousands of communities across the country uh, that are very dependent on fossil fuels and related products, you know, including their governments and the public services. So, you know, absent these types of measures sort of to like be intentional about building domestic industries and, you know, the place-based focus that Samira mentioned, um, there's a real risk of sort of the degrading economic competitiveness of the American energy industry and, you know, distressed communities throughout the country uh, that would make it, you know, even equity issues aside, it would just make it very, very difficult, if not impossible, to sustain uh, an energy transition. So um, I really don't know the extent to which IRA is going to solve these problems. These are really difficult problems. But I guess that the point I want to make is that it gives us a fighting chance that we wouldn't have otherwise. You know, in, in hearing all of you talk, I'm just really struck at how extraordinary this conversation is that we're actually having. Um, you know, if you've been in economic policy for a while here in Washington, to hear about supply and demand side actions and the valley of death and needing to move beyond that, to hear about place-based policies and specific ways we're going to focus not just on building something, but also other elements of how, you know, childcare fits into that to focus on rural development at the level of the Bs, as Benga mentioned, instead of the, the Ms of the millions, um, and to have a real conversation about spending and climate to, to hit the essential targets that we need. It's really just an amazing moment. And I, I think I'm, I'm struck both by that, but also by the magnitude of the challenge in the sense that, you know, it's great to pass legislation, but the work really doesn't stop there. That's sort of act one. The act two is you then have to implement all of this, which is really a quite extraordinary task um, and one that in different ways you've all engaged with or are thinking about. And so, so I wanna turn to, to dig a little deeper into the implementation side. So Joel, I'm curious if you could tell us first a little bit about how you're thinking about implementation generally. Um, and then specifically, given your previous role as chief economist uh, at the Labor Department, you know, thinking about the role of workers, um, a lot of what we've talked about here involves building 
uh, whether that's infrastructure or factories that will involve production in the future. Um, how do we, how is the administration thinking about the role of workers and uh, labor in, in this effort? Sure. Um, so implementation is clearly a top priority for the administration. We've passed historic pieces of legislation that we were all a part of, of shaping and getting over the finish line. Many of you, you in this room were a part of shaping and getting over the finish line, but now we have to do it well, right? There is, you know, a risk if we don't do it well, because we're essentially asking government to do a lot of really big things really fast. And so this is a top priority. Um, all of our agencies are very focused on this, agencies that have you know, new loan authorities, new grant programs, agencies like Treasury that are implementing the tax credits, agencies that have long since and will continue to be focused on workforce issues, including the Department of Labor from whence I've just came. Um, and, uh, and so this is really, really important to, to do things well, to do things quickly, and to do things inclusively. And I think that all three of those things are possible to do at the same time, which I think is an important thing when we think about implementation, because often the trade-off is do things fast and efficiently or do things inclusively and do things in a way that benefit everyone. And it's actually possible to do those, those both those things. Um, and I think that you'll see that in how we are trying to, um, you know, benefit workers as we actually implement these bills. Um, and so, Samira mentioned the, the CHIPS NOFO, as people call it, which is a notice of funding opportunity for those of you who don't spend too much time talking to government bureaucrats. Um, and, 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 and when that came out, there was also a lot of criticism, right? Why would you actually talk about childcare when you're talking about just trying to get a few big companies to come to the US and build semiconductor manufacturing facilities, fabs? Um, well, first of all, we're not just trying to do that. We're trying to build a diverse and thriving semiconductor industry and supply chain in the US, which is bigger than a few companies. And two, you know, that means that you're not really understanding what it takes to build things. You mentioned we, we're talking about building things. Who builds things? Workers do, right? And so if we do not actually build quality jobs, create quality jobs, you know, break down barriers to people being able to participate in the workforce, to be able to sustain their families when they're in the workforce, this doesn't work. And so I think that that's really, really important, especially when you think about the state of the labor market today. We have, as, as Director Young said, created more than 13 million jobs since the president took office. The prime age labor force participation rate is the highest it's been since June 2007. Sorry, you're about to get me on a soliloquy now. You asked me to talk about labor market, lots of, lots of opinions. <laughs> Um, and, and, and yet the labor force participation rate overall is not where it was before because there are a lot of structural things happening in the U.S. labor market. On the supply side, we have an aging population, of course, and that's why care is important for so many things. But it's also important to care for those people. Um, care has value in and of itself. Um, on top of that, you know, we, we've had you know, lower and slower rates of immigration, and we have structural barriers that keep people from feeling like they have a shot in the labor market, especially people in communities that have been left behind. There's disconnected workers. There are people who need access to care. There are formerly incarcerated workers who don't feel like they actually have opportunities in the labor market, so they don't participate. And so there are, there are things that we need to do in order to actually grow the size of our workforce to be able to actually build the things we're talking about building. And on top of that, you know, on the demand side, we need to actually create quality jobs that people can sustain a family on, union jobs that actually give people voice in the workforce. And so all of these things work together to make this whole thing work, to create a more productive, innovative workforce that can sustain this massive project that we're undertaking. That's a really important point because it, it gets to a little bit of the, the story too, which is a sense that you, know, you build a strong economy when we have this virtuous cycle and all of the different pieces fit together and it's good for, for everyone. Um, Samira, how do you see the, the biggest challenges in the implementation process? Um, what, do you, what would you flag uh, as the, the places where you're most worried or think are gonna be most difficult or maybe to put it a different way, where do you see the greatest opportunities uh, for, for change or for, for making progress in the implementation system? Um, you know, uh, it's hard to pick like just one challenge and opportunity here, but I, I want to build on something Felicia flag. People are so concerned about building. Can we build? Do we know how to build as a country? And um, point to the fact that so many of us have grown up in a generation of this politics of austerity where we were fighting over a shrinking pie. And I, my background, I come out of doing a lot of state and local economic development work. So 
I just saw time and time again, they were, we were like organizing around a plan on housing, a plan on small business promotion, a and there was no money to fund these plans. So you couldn't get the private sector and the foundations and the community groups mobilized to like really work hard on these things because they were like, we can't invest in it at the scale that the problem requires to have the transformations that we want to see in our community. Well, guess what? Now they can. And so this public investment is going to be really catalytic at dry, at pulling our country together, especially at the local level and at the regional level, because um, people have been really sick over years, sick of and tired of making plans that sit on the shelf and don't go anywhere because nobody has the funding to um, to implement them. And the other thing that I think that is a complexity, but actually, as Joel said, it's like actually the feature of the plan to make it happen, right, is that for a lot of these things to work, you need labor and industry to work together. You need community-based organizations and local government to work together, and that's how we're going to build fast and equitably. And there are both incentives and requirements in there to say that equity is the stronger and faster growth model here. Um, and so what I feel really excited about in this moment is how much social entrepreneurship this is all going to, um, that it's already starting to kick off um, in the country and that that will help knit our country back together over, especially over the forces that want to keep us divided with like culture war issues. And so they're going to keep bringing hate and bringing culture, culture wars. And instead, we're all going to bring them jobs and lower costs <laughs> instead. And I'm, I'm really um, excited about that. And I think the fact that these bills are not short term stimulus, they're five to 10 years of investment give folks like folks in this room and the groups on the ground that you all work with time to plan and build their expertise and build all these new business models. I've spent years studying things like the late 19th century and looking at how in that moment of the Gilded Age, we also had cooperatives and credit unions form and whole new types of market-based models emerge but that wasn't government doing it, it was the people doing it. And so again, to borrow what from what Felicia said, like the government is us and it's not the government that does everything, it's it's the people and, the, and people mobilized and organized working together to do it. I think that's a really, a really great point how this is going to engage and mobilize people and act as a real focal point for organizing. Um, there's another group, though, that has to be organized, uh, which is the government. And I think one of the challenges uh, I at least have seen in, in thinking about this is there's a lot of different programs, a lot of different uh, agencies that are part of this. And so, so Benga, I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit you know, about how the different agencies are working together. Obviously, you know, rural America, for example, is not only uh, uh, something that the Department of Agriculture works on, you know, broadband is in a different agency. So so how are you thinking about the coordination or how's, how are people in the government thinking about coordination across agencies to, to do that level of organizing? That is a great question. And um, I want to actually pick up from what Joel said, saying that we can do fast and equitable and that's not a trade off. But a lot of times it's been a trade-off because especially the communities, rural communities, you know, a lot of these programs you have to apply for, you have to do a grant or a loan. And so to do a grant, you have to apply. And these applications are bare. Like I've read through applications that are like a thousand pages, feasibility studies, you know, all these things and, you know, Dunn's numbers and Sam's numbers and all this stuff, right? And if you have a town of 2,000, who's going to do that? And so the reason why it was always that trade-off is because and you know the you know, rural development people are like oh you got this money you have to obligate it quickly well who are you going to obligate it the people that you that you you know need take time with or the people that have already you know gone through the process and so you send the money out you go to the usual suspects and that's what happens and so it's always been a trade off but to your point it's not a trade off and it's not a trade off because we've created this framework and a structure to be able to reach these underserved communities and so through you know we have our two uh, executive orders on equity that kind of told us like, well, you know, look at your access to uh, barriers to access to capital 
and try to surmount those. You know, look at, um, there's the uh, recent, the Environmental Justice Executive Order, you know, first one in 30 years that talks about you need to do public outreach, engagement, you need to track these things. And so, you know, one of the things to do is that we have all these federal government resources and we have all these underserved communities, but there's been this gap forever. And it's like, how do we bridge that gap? How do we build the capacity of these communities so that they can access these federal government resources? And that's what we're doing now. That's what we've done over the last two years. So one example is that we have this initiative called the Rural Partners Network. What it, this is, is we're in 36, uh, 36 community networks, 10 states in Puerto Rico, and we put community liaisons in these communities. So each state has about two to five community networks. And so the community liaison would work with the community, figure out what their needs are, and then what the key is, and this is to your point, to your question is that we have what we call rural desk officers, people from every single uh, agency. So there's a HUD rural desk officer, a commerce rural desk officer, a labor rural desk officer. So if there's like, oh, we need workforce housing, where can we get that? The community liaison, then he tapped the HUD rural desk officer, USDA labor, and then help them to access those resources. And so what this is, is while we're only in, you know, 10 states in Puerto Rico, it's a model to be able to connect these communities to build this capacity. And so when they build a capacity, they'll get that first grant. That next grant is going to be a little bit easier to get. And then in five to 10 years, they're able to, they're at the table and they're able to participate fully. And so that's the kind of thing. And there's you know, plenty of other throughout. Department of Transportation has a thriving communities network where they do that. Uh, Samir talked about Tic Tacs. You know, we have throughout the government all these, um, all these uh, structures to help these communities that haven't been able to participate, to be able to participate. Because I think back to what Director Young was saying, that you know we all suffer through this pandemic. But for certain communities, this, is, this was nothing new. We think about the great financial recession and how we were able to recover you know, quickly. But it's like, who got to recover, right? And then we ever ask the question of who's benefiting from these programs. But now we are asking this question throughout the federal government, who is benefiting? Who is not benefiting? We think about public outreach. The question is, you know, who are we not talking to? And then like, okay, if we're going to talk to them, how do we talk to them? We always talk about we do surveys, we reach out with surveys. A lot of these rural communities don't even have high speed internet. So how do you do a survey? Are you doing outreach? So we're, you know, going through this stuff is trying to figure out how do we reach these communities and then how do we connect these communities with the resources that already exist? And so that's how we're thinking about it. So I wanna I wanna jump um from local to to global for for a moment and then we'll go to questions so get ready get ready uh audience members with your questions but but no you know you mentioned and and i think one of the important pieces of the climate challenge of course is that it's a global one we've we've heard though uh from some countries uh maybe some skepticism about uh these programs um so you know how do you see the international dimension of these programs and and what's the reaction to you know, countries that might be a little concerned that the United States is putting this big investment in. Yeah, that that's it's an important issue, and I think I, th I think part of it's probably overblown, and part of it's um, is, is underblown a word. Part of it's underblown. <laughs> um, you know, you know, I think a lot of attention has gone to uh, you know our allies in Europe, in particular, and and their negative reactions uh, to to some of the provisions in in, in IRA. Um, and, you know, to, to some extent, I think these are just the type of measures that you're going to need in a country like the United States to sustain decarbonization over many decades. And to the extent that is true and other countries, you know, the, the, they're talking to us, they're reading the news also, they, they know it's true. Uh, I think the world, frankly, just needs to adapt to some extent. And I think People know that, and I think increasingly you're seeing that, um, and you're seeing the administration go out and create, um, you know, new agreements with different countries. You know, you know, critical minerals agreements, um, sort of semi-free trade agreements that um, assuage some of these concerns um, that, that that Europe and others have had over the bill. Um, and I think that's a good thing. The, the the part I guess I'm more concerned about is when it comes to the lower income countries, uh, who I think also, uh, you know, are a little bit concerned about what they are seeing. And I think they come at, especially the climate energy transition issue, t 
to be frank, they're a little pissed off already, I think, because they've been promised a lot over the years uh, when it comes to, you know, funding to help them decarbonize and adapt to climate change. Um, and, the, you know, the, the developed countries just have not followed through at all. So um, I do think we need to be cognizant that, you know, for, 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 to, to their ears, this idea of revitalizing American manufacturing, um, you know, does, doesn't sound um, so terrific because there, there, there are some zero sum elements to that. And I think we need to be cognizant of that. Um, and I think it's sort of incumbent on the United States to really sort of show leadership on this front, uh, you know, when it comes to really important problems like, you know, the, the, the crazy high financing costs of um, decarbonization projects in lower income countries. Um, you know, let, let's talk about climate clubs that are incentive compatible across these countries and, and, and not just tariffs. Because um, as you said, climate is really a global problem that requires a global solution. And this is where the emissions are going forward, right? They're, they're predominantly in the, in the developing world. So let's turn to the, to the audience for, for a couple of questions. And what I'll do is I'll take maybe a few questions and then we'll give the, the panelists both a chance to respond and their, and their last word all combined. Um, so I've got one hand over here. Hi, good morning. Woo. I'm Ana Aurelia with Economic Security Project. Thanks so much for everything that you're doing to make a healthier planet. I wanted to flag one thing that no one has mentioned, which is there's a government agency, the IRS, uh, not the most charismatic agency, not most beloved, and it is now under attack, right? It's seen as a cash cow. Already a quarter of the big chunk of money was cut to, as part of the debt ceiling negotiations, and yet without a functioning IRS, most of the money that we're trying to get out the door isn't going to happen, and most of the customer service and the tax credits that many of us are fighting for, that's not going to be easily accessible as well. So what can we do and what can you do to make sure that we keep that IRS funding intact? And I saw uh, maybe there's a hand right here if you want to pass your mic over uh, in the row. Yep. Great. Next. Hi, Sarah Anderson from the Institute for Policy Studies. Thanks for talking about the community benefits associated with the CHIPS uh, subsidies related to child care. There's also the disincentives for blowing money on stock buybacks, which many of us are excited about. I don't see a real logical reason, though, as to why those kinds of conditions should just apply to semiconductor companies um, and wondering what we could be doing so that uh, taxpayer money going to all different kinds of uh, projects private corporations have similar kinds of um, conditions. And let's go to the final question uh, right here and then on the aisle. Yes. Hi. Um, thank you all so much. Um, I'd love to follow up, please, um, on Benga's point about storytelling. I work at the local level, and um, I, I have a hard time um, extrapolating to the more national level. How can we be getting? these really important stories and messages out so that they take hold in a way that that shows they're successful. I think it's such an incredibly important point. So I'd love to hear more about that. Thanks. Great. Three three terrific questions. So we'll give our panelists uh, uh, a, a very luxurious 30 seconds each to to wrap up here so we're we're ready and staying on time. So uh, Joel, why don't I start with you? You can either you know react to any of the questions or or give us some final thoughts. Sure. So I think those are all great questions. Um, I'll start with the storytelling, as that was the, the last one that I heard. I think that that's, that's very important, right? It's very easy, especially in a place like Washington, D.C., to only speak to certain audiences or to only speak in the terms that certain audiences care about. And so, you know, we're doing more and more to get out to communities to talk about what's going on. I think that's started to, to happen after the Cabinet meeting on Tuesday with the Invest in America agenda. We have a whole map of all these places that are getting investments in. As an administration, we need to go there um, from the senior level to, you know, more junior levels, people who are running specific programs, who are the actual people you need to talk to to get funding. Um, and so we need to go there and actually explain what's going on and, and, and make sure that we are making sure that our programs are accessible. We also need to be at the table when it comes to working with, you know, labor, businesses, community organizations to make sure that we're hearing their concerns and also helping to coordinate across different programs as well. I think there's 
been examples of where we've done that well. We've talked about communities that could be displaced by um, changes in energy markets. There's an initiative called Energy Communities that does some of that work really well, has resources that are focused on specific communities, and actually goes out to those communities, has staff based in those communities to be able to help them access resources. I'm now going too long. This is really more an issue. Um, so I want to say that there's ways that structurally the government can think about how to engage. Um, I say that just because of where I sit, but there are, of course, other things that we need to do um, as, a, as a movement. Um, and then I would say that, you know, overall, I think we're pushing to make sure that we can have better incentives, better standards that are that are pro-labor, that are accountable, especially when it, when it comes to our competition agenda, to make sure that the outcomes from a lot of the programs that we have are actually going towards the people they're meant to serve, not necessarily, not necessarily the people who've always benefited from these kinds of initiatives. Uh, again, those are great questions. To the community benefits one, is um, Department of Energy has some of their programs. Uh, I think also the executive order on the environmental justice helps to kind of get that. I think we, you know, kind of talk about what's being done in terms of community benefits agreements and then also to be able to kind of show how it works and to be able to kind of give the government, you know, models to do that. Uh, to the storytelling, so rural development, we actually have a web, pa uh, web page that has success stories and that we always update. And so we have, so it's one of those things where to try to find that and then just to kind of uplift that through social media, through news, through other things. But uh, again, very important point. Um, I actually have the same response across all three. And thank you, Benga, for pointing out that we, these worker and community benefits agreements are in a lot of programs, and we, we, the government, the administration is is continuing to expand them and refine them and make them work better. But um, I think for all three of those questions, the answer is like we need to stay organized and keep at it. And I know that's really exhausting because so many of you organized for so long to get these bills passed and. It's just kind of the way our country works. You got to like organize to get it done and then keep fighting to keep prevent it from getting clawback. And one of the important ways to fight against the clawback is to tell a good story. Tell a good story about concrete specific benefits at the local level and have trusted messengers be the ones to deliver it. They're not going to trust Joe Biden in their community telling them that story. They're going to trust their neighbor or like the local people that they know because I, Again, I don't live in Washington. I live in like real America. I like to say I live in I live in the South. I live in Atlanta, and there is just so much disillusionment in what politicians say and the federal government says. So we need like local trusted messengers out there telling the story, and it takes it's going to take a long time to build some of these things and to shift these markets. And so we have to get good at having um each step in the process get celebrated we're not good at celebrating progressives like we just like to fight and be angry but i hope we can learn to celebrate and applaud and get people excited and keep them motivated because we need them to say i know this hasn't hit you yet but you don't want it clawed back because we're all working to help lower those costs or to get those jobs to you we need a little bit more time to do it don't let um the republicans take it away from us so Noah? Yeah, I mean, I totally agree with the, the importance of storytelling. That I guess the one thing I want to add is that parallel to that, I think we, we also, you know, we can't just go in with sort of the rosy-eyed glasses, those of us who really like the, these, these bills. We have to recognize that there's going to be failures also, and it's really important that we also uh, recognize those failures and a, you know, you know, we're just obsessive about figuring out what works, what isn't going to work, um, because this is just the first step, right? If 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 this, we hope that this is a many decades long project, and if we're going to get good and if we're going to sustain this this type of project, um, I think we need to get better and better at it. So um, I would just say let's let's celebrate the successes and uh, let's learn from the failures. I think I think that's a great place to end in part because this isn't a one time thing. Uh, this is a long effort, not just in the five or 10 years, but hopefully the things that we learn how to do here in the next few years or in the next decade, we can build on and continue to do more uh, and to build a new kind of economy where we're really investing in, in this in a broader set of places and in a broader set of ways. Um, so thank you very much to everyone on the panel. Oh, I go just, ahead. I, I, I couldn't resist one more thing. The website Joelle talked about, could folks raise their hand? Has anyone looked at that website that the administration put out? It is incredible. It is like data down to like, I think the county and city level specific information about jobs and investments. What is the website? Invest.gov. 
just go look at this map because it'll help you get the data you need to tell those local stories. Invest.gov. And, and on that note, um, we're going to move to a break right now. Uh, so thank you all, and thank you very much to the panelists for a great comments.